Mm. Yeah, well, to an extent, this ceremony is all about the option, the, the alternative to that. So perfect. We'll leave, that, we'll leave that for other people, and we'll just talk about the positive stuff. Yeah, perfect. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, there's enough negative stuff on this planet right now, mate, to fill up 20 planets. It'd still be pouring out. All right, we'll get this recorder started here. Okay. All right, we've got Stephen Strong back with us from ForgottenOrigin.com. Uh, this has been two years, over two years now, two years and three months before we, uh, since we had you on. It's hard to buy, believe how time flies, but uh, thanks for coming back to talk to us. It's a pleasure, always a pleasure. I didn't know it was two years, but of course, when you get to my age, it all goes very quickly anyway, so I'm yeah. happy with that. Well, this last year was like a fast, it was fast and slow yeah. all, all at once. Yeah, it definitely was. Yeah. So, well, yeah, I've been following uh, your, your work a little bit in the last few days, your your videos and your, um, you know, you guys are doing research on ancient origins and all that kind of stuff. We love the, you know, the out of Australia theory. We talked to, Probably since we talked to you, we've talked to um, Bruce Fenton about his his work that seems to fit in a little bit with with yours. I'm not sure if you guys know each other or not, but there we go. But yeah, um, yeah maybe we could talk about what uh, you know your ceremony that you guys went to in December. Maybe we can give some background on uh, on that. I mean, it's really up to up to you what you think is most important for people to know right now. Yeah, I'll look obviously for. Um a lot of different reasons we do a lot of work on a lot of different things but at the moment i think the ceremony does come first and um yeah we did go up to uluru and um we're involved in that um and there are a lot of results uh which we'll be putting up um where do you start with that yeah one? well let's let's All start right. with what uluru is for people that that aren't even sure about that like let's, yeah, let's, well, that's let's, probably the best way to go. Let's make the assumption there are people here that know nothing of yeah, it. There yeah. will be some. I think the best way to do this is probably to to go through this a bit like a story, a chronological story of how it happened, and it may explain why every presentation we gave over the last two and a half years on this, we've never said we were fully convinced it would happen. And some people have challenged me and said, why aren't you more positive? And I've said, well, you haven't walked our path, and if you had, you'd know why we weren't. And I've got to be honest, the day before on the 20th, I still wasn't convinced this was going to happen. So maybe we do need to go back and try and explain how this came about. Then we could go to what happened, and then we could go to the proof. And it's very important for people today to have some sort of proof. Otherwise... Leaps of faith are harder. So let's go back about three, three and a half years ago when um, Brendan Yulukai Murray rang me, and I know him for quite some time, and he told me this story. And when I first heard it, I thought, well, yeah, that would be lovely if it happened, but gee, I don't know. What he primarily said was <clears throat> he'd been told by Arnie's that in December... 2020, which was three years ago, by the way, there'd be a ceremony there. And I said, whoa, that's interesting. That's a long way off. And he said that ceremony would be based around Uluru, the rock in the centre, and that if the ceremony was complete and successful, the world would sort of break up into two pathways. It's a bit like with the Mayans when they spoke about two roads. And he said that one would maintain itself at a lower vibration and the second one would go to an ascending higher vibration and that every soul on this planet will be drawn to the vibration that best suits their stage of development. Hmm. And that was primarily it. I got the impression then the word Pleiadians was discussed and, of course, in Australia, the seven sisters of the Pleiades is the only dreaming story that's told in every tribal boundary. So that part was a sort of, yeah, well, we knew that was happening anyway. And that's how this story started. And I've got to be honest, when I first heard that, I had an issue at the start. There was two. I asked him about what happens to the souls that don't do well, that don't pick the right path, and I wasn't overly taken by the explanation, but that changed. And the one thing I've got to tell you is over the period of time, that what followed that, 
with a lot of original stuff, you get drip fed information. I wish you, someone would give you the whole story then and there, but it's just not how they do things here. So what then happens is over the years the past, we speak to other elders who say, yes, we've heard of this. Yes, there is supposed to be a ceremony, but you've got to remember something. The ceremony at Uluru, whether it's the Anangu, the Pichinjachara, whichever group's involved in that, the sacred ceremonies like that, it's not shared with other people. So people hear rumours and bits and pieces of this, and that's what we were getting. And so for quite some time, that's as far as it got. And we started mentioning the fact there'd be a ceremony there, but we had no intentions of going. Uh, and then about just as COVID began, another person contacted us and said they wanted to see us about the ceremony. So we met on the central coast of New South Wales at a place called Yamina, and he asked to bring along some rocks, which we did. And then he told us that those rocks would be needed in the ceremony, and would we take them there? And I undenied about this for a while, but he kept insisting that we needed to go there, and we agreed to that. And primarily from what that from that point, what we then had is what we thought was a fairly solid base. We had about four people contacting us, telling us the same story. But I've got to make the point, and I made this every time, at no stage was I ever in direct contact with the elders there. Now, that's a leap of faith, honestly, because normally when I go on to country, I work with the elders entirely, always. And here I'm working with other people speaking on their behalf. And that is why every time I spoke, I said, well, this is what I've been told. But I don't have direct confirmation. And I didn't have that until the 20th of last month. I never <laughs> had direct confirmation. So, okay, so this is what happens. And then I, I'm starting to feel pretty confident because I've got these people telling me, saying, taking the rocks, they'll be need to be there. Then lo and behold, one of the people that's advising me then turns against us and puts up postings, puts up postings like, if we turn up at Uluru, they'll call the whole ceremony off and the whole world will suffer because we turned up there. And all of a sudden, he, this person contacts us and tell us, tells us about the magic box, and we thought, what the hell is that? And we contact him and say, you sure that's right? Oh, no, you've got to put this up, you've got to put this up. And later on, he says, there is no magic box. So... All this background information is taking place. When we're getting information coming one way, it's going in one door and some's going out the other. So this continues. Then I'm contacted by um, Catherine McCann, who run a conference up there at Uluru. So Uluru, it, so Uluru for people that aren't sure, that's that big rock in, in Australia, that's right? That's the big rock in the middle, and that's the base of this whole story. It's all based around the magic box being at Uluru. It's all based around ceremonies being held at Uluru. And, of course, Katajuka, which is the woman's site, there's something going on there too. But being a male, none of my business. Okay. I don't know what I'm Okay. So that continues, and then we find... One of the main people is now basically telling everyone on the planet what we're saying is rubbish, everything we do is ego-driven, don't listen to us. So I'm getting two pieces of information all the way through. So they contact us and say, well, we'd like to speak there. Well, lo and behold, the days they're holding that ceremony is the 20th, the 21st, and the 22nd of December. We were going to Uluru anyway. And they're offering us free accommodation at the sales, and I'm thinking, well, there's a win for us. We were going to go there anyway. Now we've just got to do a bit of talking as well, and we can do both things at once. So everything's falling nicely into place. But then, of course, we've also got people attacking us all over, saying there is no such thing as the ceremony. Then they started attacking, and an elder put out a statement about the conference we were going to. And she said that that conference is not approved by the elders, and all the speakers there are offending everybody. Well, that was weird because we were the only people speaking about the ceremony there. And there were three other original elders there talking about other stuff. And I actually said to people, well, well, most of these people don't even know about it. How can they be offending something if they don't speak about it and don't know about it? And the conference was booked at that date 18 months before, and they've been doing it twice a year for five years. They've done 10 conferences there. So really, 
The statements that were coming up attacking these people, they did nothing wrong. They were just holding another conference and there people were going to talk about meditation, channeling, star language, nothing to do with this. But we were the only ones doing it. So, lo and behold, okay, we get there and I get there and I meet the people who are organising they said, oh, we just went and saw someone and said, they know nothing about this. I'm thinking, oh, my God. I'm supposed to be talking about this tomorrow, and here I am on the 20th, and I'm not even convinced it's on. So I then contacted two elders who have got impeccable uh, credentials, and the first one said to me, oh, absolutely, it's going to happen. And he gave me some advice, which I'm going to pass on. He said, strap on your seatbelt and get ready for the ride because it's going to be bumpy. I thought, okay, fair enough. And then that day, on the 20th, after we'd done a particular presentation i get a phone call from the elders i thought oh finally okay on the 20th and yes the good news is the conference is that the actual ceremony is going to happen so i'm thinking oh finally okay so when i speak about this i now have something to talk about because it is on but then they tell me the time i was given which i was given at the very beginning by the same gentleman who turned against us I stuck by his time because it made sense to me. He said it was going to be 9.02 because the park closes at 9 o'clock and they did a couple of minutes to prepare the ceremony. I thought, well, that makes sense because before that, people would be in the park and they shouldn't be there. So I got told 24 hours out, no, no, it's not 9.02, it's 7.32. Well, I thought, oh, my God. So we've then had to basically run back to every contact we've got and spread the news around the time it changed, and that actually worked. That was fine. But the second part was I started to talk to this group about the rocks. And yes, they did want the rocks. But it became apparent to me that whether they had the rocks or not, this ceremony was going to happen. And for reasons I don't want to go into, I decided the rocks were better used with the group that had come there. So there we are. On the day before the ceremony, on the 20th, I've got a phone call. Yes, the ceremony is on. And then we find out because the ceremony is at 7.30, the park is open to 9 o'clock at night. So the whole of the group there, 350 people, are allowed, they had permission to go to this viewing platform about 3 k's from the rock, do their meditation there, and be in the vicinity of the elders doing that. All sounds great, doesn't it? Everything sounds fantastic. And then on the 20th, lo and behold, the manager of sales, the manager of the whole complex, interrupts our talk and reads a note that's been written by the Northern Territory government that changes everything. And it starts with this. You guys have probably heard of the word COVID, I'm sure, and you're sure you're aware of it. In Australia, for the, we've had none for about two and a half months, and now we're having a minor, major problem around here because in the whole of Australia, there are six people with COVID and everyone's running around with their head cut off. They're really panicking. Six. The whole of Australia, six people have got COVID. Anyway, everyone's gone ballistic and crazy. And what happened was those six people were found in one part of Sydney. So we get a letter that says all the people in Sydney are now persona non grata. They don't want them there. And they're sending one flight up an empty plane from Jetstar, what? 8.30 in the morning, and they want all of the what? people from Sydney out. Where are you guys from? Where are you guys from? Oh, we're from Byron Bay, 800, 800 k's away. But the problem is, in Sydney, it was only locked into one area, the northern beaches, where we had a massive outbreak over a week of, I think, 12 people who had it. Right, The rest of Sydney had none at this time, and nobody from the northern beaches were there. So they're all thinking, well, what's happened? How come this has all changed? But it's a letter. And what it says is the police are coming from Alice Springs en masse. And anyone from Sydney will be locked down if they don't get on that plane. Now, the audience there is made up of about 100 people from Sydney. And a lady came up to me and told me this. My two children being looked after, if I don't get on that plane tomorrow, I've got to self-isolate at the sales, which is around about $800 a night. For two weeks, and I don't see my kids for Sydney. What should I do? I said to this woman, I don't think you've got a choice. If you want to be with your kids, you've got to get on that plane. So anyway, that night, 
There are signs up at the takeaway noodle bar there. If you're from Sydney, don't come near us. Ring through and we'll deliver to you because no one from Sydney should be near us. So there they are sitting inside. There are about 150 people all getting migraine headaches. And what the hell am I going to do? Because the police are coming tomorrow and we're envisioning 40 police banging on the door of the Sydney ones. And as you get back to your unit that night, everyone had that letter stuck underneath there. So the morning comes. The flight comes and about 50 people get on that plane. Soon after, Jetstar make an announcement. Please ignore the uh, announcement from before. It now turns out flights will be coming here and from Sydney you can catch the flights. Then lo and behold, the next thing that happens, it wasn't 40 police, it was two police. Nobody from Sydney was locked down. A phone call went to every unit and I got one too. And they said, have you been to this hotspot? I said, no, and I hung up, and they hung up. The people from Sydney got the same phone call. That morning, they were having breakfast with all of us. And I'm thinking, hang on, what's going on here? Then lo and behold, for the first time ever, Uluru's locked down at 10 o'clock. It was open since 7, and people were in there. They raced around and shot them all out, and it was locked down for the whole of the day of that ceremony. And I'm thinking, whoa, there's something weird going on here for sure. And what I was doing is I bought the rocks originally for the elders. And I thought, well, since I'm not going to do it for the elders, I'm going to run a ceremony next to the pool at the complex there for all the people who came there that weren't part of the actual complex, the actual conference taking place. And then they come back to me and said, what are we going to do? And we go to the sales group and we tell them what's going on. What can we do? Well, we've got 350 people with no place to put on a ceremony. What shall we do? And we got one. They gave us the football field with the toilets. Not quite sacred ground, but I knew if I aimed all the rocks, I had about 60 of them, at the goalpost, the left-hand goalpost that aims directly at Uluru. So to cut a very long story short, we had the park closed down for the first time ever on the 21st. The police said they were coming, but they didn't. All of the group from Sydney were terrorised by this, and the whole group were worried for the group from Sydney, and I think what they were trying to do was to create fear and concern within the group that were part of this. I think it was deliberate. Mm -hmm. I don't understand how a, a flight company can say on one day we're sending one more plane, and after that they then say, please ignore what we said, they'll be coming up as normal. I don't understand why all of Sydney were told that night They'll be locked down inside the next morning. No one was there. They came out and had dinner and breakfast with everyone else. And when they got back in the planes, nobody even took their temperature. So I was wondering what was taking place to begin with. So what we have is leading up to this ceremony, absolute chaos all the way through. So then what happens is we do that ceremony about 15 k's from Uluru. We were the closest there with 300 people. I put the rocks in formation and we spent 20 minutes from just before 7.32 until well after in full meditation aimed at the rock. And primarily, we did a ceremony there. Now, the interesting part of this story was, okay, with all that going on, did it work? Did this ceremony actually take place? Did what we thought would happen occur? Well, by our count, there are around about 15 million people around the world involved in this, in different countries. Well, obviously, not 15 million in Australia, but around the world. That's a rough count of the different groups were involved and the numbers that they actually recorded. And it did work. And how can I explain this? It worked in ways that I was quite surprised by. Now, what I found interesting was on the next day of the conference, somebody said to me that I'm here, my family think that what I'm doing is ridiculous, this whole ceremony is a load of rubbish. And he said to me, how can I convince my family of what actually happened? And I told them, you can't. I said, but what you can do, and I'll get, get back to this a sec, you can do something called seed dreaming. And primarily what I said was you'll throw the seeds out, some will land on concrete, some will land on rocks, and some will land in the soil, and sometimes it'll take a while to sprout. But you can't make people believe in this. It can't happen that way. It's different. They've got to accept this. Now, to an extent, 
I think it's brilliant that 15 million people got involved in this, considering on every occasion I told people I'm not convinced it's true. I think that's a great leap of faith, that they went and backed themselves to do this, even though I was saying right up until the day of doing this, I wasn't sure if this was going to happen. I think credit should be given to those people. But what did happen was way beyond what I would expect. I thought I'd come out of this saying, well, you know, we felt good and everything was great and everyone said they felt differently. I didn't think we'd have as much empirical proof to validate what actually took place. And that's what I'd like to share with you a bit. The things that came in, photographs, graphs, and activities that took place everywhere that convinced me that ceremony did work. And I'll start with this. I don't know if you're aware of this, but there's two, four things that happen in our solar system that need to be factored into this. And they've all taken place since the 21st of uh, December. Number one, are you gentlemen aware of what's happened to Pluto? No. I was right. right. All I know about is the great conjunction okay ah, well and that's part of it that's part wasn't of it wasn't it wasn't it like the first full or it wasn't like now so i feel like we've entered full this moon on solstice? No, no 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 we've entered this weird age where i don't know what to believe about anything anymore because yeah. the internet is just full of everything but i thought yeah. i seen something that said it was like exactly one pluto rotation since like america started well, America's, Pluto and America are very important. Let's go through what happened at that time. Yes, you're right. There was a grand conjunction that hadn't happened since 1222, okay, between Jupiter and Saturn. But you have to throw in the fact that five hours before was the winter and summer solstice. Yeah, that's different. Yeah, that didn't yeah. happen before. That's a bit more that's different. Now, let's add to this. Pluto, the atmosphere in Pluto over the last month and a half has condensed fivefold. It's only one that the, the atmosphere that goes out of Pluto has come down to one fifth the size it was before it's become condensed. Neptune. A bloody climate change. I don't know which way it spins. It used to spin, I think, from east to west. Well, soon after the 21st, it stopped completely. It is now spinning the reverse way, and NASA can't work out why. It's now going west to east, or whatever it was before. It stopped for a period of time and has reversed around. During, after the 21st and on the 21st and 22nd was the largest radiation and solar winds that have come out of the sun in years. So what I'm getting at is around the place at this time, the planets were also reacting to what was taking place in this conjunction in different ways. So we use that as a base. Now, the things I'm going to share with you that took place on this planet, I can tell you, Three are already been posted, and the next three are going up in an article we're putting up tomorrow, so they will all be there. What we've got is number one. We have a picture that came in from Croatia. Now, it's on our website, and I'll try and describe it, and I can tell you I'm getting feedback today because what happened in Croatia before people say Photoshop, which they will, <laughs> I've got to tell you, we're getting clips from Croatia now because this went viral on Facebook. Everyone was talking about what they saw, okay? So on our, we've posted up on our Forgotten Origin, we've posted up this picture. And what it is, it looks like there's a saucer in the sky and then there's a golden beam of light that runs straight into the water. Yeah, we got it, it here, it looks like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you've got it. Yeah. Okay. Now, I can tell you before, and by the way, you'll notice that the, the telegraph lines, the uh, wires run across that golden beam. So if this is photoshopping, this is pretty bloody good. But more importantly, the whole of Croatia, it went viral. Hundreds upon hundreds of people saw it. Not said, I saw the photograph, but saw it. Yeah. And we're discussing what it was. Can I remind you that two days after that hit, Croatia had its largest earthquake. Wow. Also bear in mind that a week after this, when this vibration took place on the 21st, and I've got pictures of, we're coming up to that, Antarctica had two earthquakes. One was 9.6 and one of 9.7. That's the largest earthquake ever recorded. 9.2 in Chile was the highest before that. But there were two earthquakes separate, and the first one was smaller than the second one. It was 9.6, 9.7 in Antarctica. So what I'm saying to people is 
There was something going on in this planet at that time. Now, where you see that particular golden light that goes straight down into the ocean, next to it, there is a graph which is called the Schumann resonance. Yep. Put that up. And this was tracked by people because they wanted to see what happened at 732. Now, on that Schumann resonance graph, you will see there is a line that runs around about 0.3 to 0.6. And at around 730, it increases 100-fold to 30. And then for the next four hours during the meditation, goes from 32 to 36, and then it runs back down when the meditation continues. But then sort of the next couple of days reverberates with that. Now, my question would be to anyone who doubts that 15 million people sending positive energy into this planet can have any effect. I want you to look at the Schumann resonance and remember people did it for about four hours and tell me that was just another coincidence. I do not believe it was. So there you've got the first two pieces of evidence we put up. The third one is the sky and that came from where we were. Because after we did yeah. the 20 minutes of meditation, um, we had a group there that were putting on dig players and crystal bowl players and an opera singer. And we're doing other things as well to sort of keep that vibration high. She couldn't get the people back because everyone was looking at the sky. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The woman there called Kay, who's the chief security guard for Uluru, I turned to her and said, have you ever seen sky like this before? That, she does, said, look, that does look crazy with the... With the blue, yeah. the blue in the middle. Ah, there. Hmm. let's talk about the blue in the middle. Let's remember this is sunset, ladies and gentlemen, and have a look at this sky underneath the clouds, and you'll see underneath the clouds the sky is all washed out grey, with just a pin, just a little tinge of blue in it. Right, that is the normal colour of your sky at sunset, but in the middle of that cloud, there's a gap. And there is the deepest blue you would ever imagine. This flowing out of the hot pinks and the oranges and all the other colours there. We are going to put up in our next three photographs a picture of the clouds 10 minutes before. And 10 minutes before, they're just grey. They're just completely grey. And then in the next 10 minutes, they turn into this multicoloured cloud with this massive blue piercing through the centre. And everyone kept pointing at the blue and said, that's wrong. Well, it is wrong. It can't happen, but it did. We had bird sign there. We had elders, original people saying they saw original spirits standing around there, nodding their head in approval. We had a lot of things that happened. But what happened after that blue was even more amazing, and I haven't got film of that yet. We'll put it up later. We had 300 people there. And after they saw that blue, they tried to get them into an arranged agreement no, doing something, yeah, yeah. but nothing happened. No. They just kept taking pictures of the sky. We got thousands of pictures of the sky. Don't tell me they were Photoshop guys. We got a thousand of them. Everyone, there was 350 people taking film of this. It's just not on. Then what happened is something weird happened to all the people there after the event. We had all the rocks set up inside fairy lights and no one was allowed to go inside there. Well, after they came back in, and there was just a dozen people that sat in a circle and started chanting, it would sound like it was a hobby ceremony or a Navajo ceremony when they go around the circle chanting. And lo and behold, that ring got bigger and bigger. And I had to start throwing the rocks into a bag to get them out of the road because it was just getting bigger and bigger. And before you knew it, there were 300 people, all arms linked, We've killed every COVID distancing thing right now. And the circles are next to one another, going around in circles, just chanting. And it went on for half an hour. Wow. No one arranged it. It just happened. Wow, that's fantastic. It was like they were being taken over with pagan sensibilities. And this is what would have happened in the old way. We would have been in circles. Yeah. And the circles rotating. And they just kept doing it. And everyone was holding arms and they were linked together. And what was was like to me, it was interesting because the 15 million people involved in this, we never said to anyone, do this meditation. They wrote to us and said, can we do it? And we said, do it. It came from the people, not from us. There was no guidance in this. It was a spontaneous arrangement of doing this. And that dance, nobody called out, let's do a dance like this. It just seemed to have happened, evolved naturally out of what was taking place. So then what you've got 
This, this went on for half an hour until it got so dark they had to get in the buses to go back. It was interesting. People came back to me after that ceremony and they all said the same thing. They've never experienced something like it. And I remember in the plane, there was one woman who said, I'm 59, until I did that ceremony, I couldn't see any reason for being here. She said, now I know why I came, why I'm on this planet. Now, those three things I've mentioned are what we've put up. The next three, we kept the best two. We're going to put one of them up now and we're holding one back for a couple more goes. We're doing this deliberately because what we're trying to do is I want people to believe in this and I want to, if you give them all the information at once, it sort of goes away after a period of time. But if you keep bringing it out step by step, it stays longer and becomes part of the way you think. This is how elders tell the story. They tell it bit by bit. So what are the next three we're going to put up? Well, the next three is we have the most important evidence of all. A different group to us that weren't there went on a platform about 20 k's away from Uluru and they filmed it at 7.32. And we have this film and it's going up. And what happens is this. They said they never saw this with their eyes. And they said there was no flash behind us. Nobody took a flash. What you've got is a running film of Uluru exploding at 7.32, and it wasn't seen by their eyes. What you see is this. You've got the whole of Uluru with the blue in the background, and then all of a sudden, for about a second and a half, the whole of the sky turns white. But Uluru doesn't. It stays exactly the same colour. The white came out of the rock and blew up to the whole sky. Now, for the people who say it's a flash, I tell you this. The intensity of the white in the corner is the same as in the middle, as in the other corner, as in every part of that picture. A flash would have a major piece of light in one area and it would trail on the sides. That's how it has to work. This was not a flash. This was Uluru just exploding with energy at that particular moment. When that went from 0.3 to 32, that's what the rock did. And it sent that energy out. And we've got reports of people all over the world feeling that energy surging through them. So I want people to look at that. It'll be up there probably tomorrow with the article, if not the day after. And that one shows you the rock turning itself on. Not up there yet, but we'll be there soon. That's number four. We also have one from Atlanta, which I believe is in America, which when you look at it from where Uluru is on the opposite side of the earth, and now that's not up yet. It's also going up tomorrow. And there you have that same intense blue and it's covered the whole of the sky itself. There's a moon behind it that's turned basically like a blue block, a blue drop completely, and the whole of the sky around this turned blue also. And to me, it's a little bit like this, but that blue has started at Uluru and just gone right through the centre of the Earth and came out at Atlanta mm. and come out on the opposite side. Now, I know scientifically we can't prove that, but hang on for a sec. We've got pictures of Uluru exploding, and we've got pictures of the blue in the sky, so why not? Why couldn't that be part of that? Was that blue in so, the sky uh, in that main picture with the sunset? Was that over Uluru? That's Uluru there, okay? That was, wow, that okay. Up. That was over and Uluru. Atlanta, okay. It was dark there, right? Yeah. So they were taking pictures in the night. So they've got a picture of the whole of their sky being locked blue at night time. And it's just gone through the whole of the clouds. And this is at night time. So what someone's going to tell me is, oh, they got all, that, got all that blue light from the moon. No, they didn't. It went through the clouds itself. It was the same blue light. I believe it went through the whole of the planet and came out of Georgia, um, Atlanta, sorry, on the other side there. That's Georgia. So, okay, so that one will be turning up soon. And the third one is going to be the picture I told you before of the clouds 10 minutes before at Uluru and when it happened. And the seventh thing we're putting up is not a photograph. And, of course, the cynics are going to say, oh, they're going to do this one. They're going to say this person made it up. But I'm going to tell you no one could make this story up. And that's why we put it up there. So we're going to give people six pictures. The three you've seen that are up there, three more that are coming up. Now, the seventh one I chose from hundreds upon hundreds of people who've written back and said it worked in so many ways. The one I chose is the one that's the hardest to believe. In fact, it's so hard to believe that I don't think anyone would have made it up. That's why we chose it. And it's not about 90,000 people that were doing one website. It's not about the mob in Iceland that were doing it out in the cold at 2 o'clock in the morning. All blessings to them for doing it. 
It's about someone in Tasmania who went into the bush on their own. And when they're on the bush on their own, and we'll put up their, their words here, I'm just going to paraphrase it to an extent. What happened was this was, they were out somewhere in a paddock somewhere, and from nowhere, one cow walked through all the bush you could see coming towards and walked straight over and stood next to her. And then at 7.32, when she was meditating, the cow started to cry. Now, I didn't know that cows cried. I had no idea that was a concept. And she said that we, the cow and myself, we both felt it. Now, I can tell you, we have so many reports of dogs and cats reacting at 7.32. And the reason I chose that story of the cow is because this cow was not trained. The dogs and the cats could have been empathetic towards their masters, and this is what they're going to say, because as you know, dogs and cats have now become semi-human and keyed in on that response and therefore cried or reacted because of that. Mm -hmm. The cow did not belong to this woman. She's never seen the cow before, and she was shocked it came and stood beside her and then at that time started to cry. Now, you can say, oh, that's all made up. No. Put it in context with the six photos you're going to see, and then you'll find it wasn't made up. Now, yes, we do have, and I'm not putting that up yet, we do have pictures of an object flying through the sky on four frames. We'll be putting that up later. We have pictures of light doing the most amazing things at 7.32 that people are going to say are camera malfunctions and for reflections off the sun. But what I'm going to say to them is this. We've got literally dozens of these photos. How can you have all these rare anomalies and malfunctions all happening exactly the same time. Yeah. It becomes after a while when you keep adding this on. I mean, how, how do you get this flash of light coming out of Uluru like that? They didn't see it. There was no one behind with a the flash. They didn't know until they looked at it, and they were shocked. They didn't know that was coming up. That was because 15 million people together, plus... The elders who started the machine, but I've got to make the point. Well, I'm not being rude to the elders. No, but the the other thing is too. Before you make that point, yeah, there was people meditating in all different groups all over the world for different reasons. I mean, that was a day when I mean I got maybe three emails from different types of groups saying, "Hey, we're meditating at eleven eleven, or we're meditating at this time, that time." I mean, that was a day where there was probably you know hundreds of millions of people sitting down quietly for for. The, probably the probably the most ever that, oh, I did, think that day. I think the most ever, for sure, mate. I that think you're day, right on yeah. it. There have never been so many people. And I did say when I was talking about this time after time, hey, I'm not sure if this is going to work, but how can 15, 20, 30 million people all shooting positive energy into this planet at one time, how can that be a bad thing right now because the world reeks of negativity? I kept saying the same thing every time that this can't be a bad thing because even if the ceremony doesn't work, we need positive thoughts on this planet anyway. But ladies and gentlemen, normally Evan does this, but he's actually basically doing an impersonation of a zombie right now, which is The Walking Dead. I'm going to try and read this because I need to read something to you, and this relates to a continent called America. And there's a group of people there, a group of Indian people there, that I believe are very much in contact with the old way called the Hopi. I don't need, I'm not going to insult you by saying if you heard them, because you obviously do know what I'm talking about. Are you aware that they've made a statement about this event? No. The, no. The whole Well, I'm going to read it out yeah. to you word for word. Okay. Okay, bear with me, because I don't normally read this. I'm crappy at doing this, so I'm going to have to put my glasses on to get this right. Oh, my wife is going to do it for me. You're going to big note yourself. All right, come over here. Okay. She's going to read it for you. And this is what they put out a couple of days ago, and I think it's very important before Dell reads this. You've heard about the Mayans talking about the two roads. You've heard about the Hoppy saying the day will come when there's a change. But you haven't heard them say until now the change has begun. Right. Now, remember, this has come after the 21st. So what I'm going to get now is my wife, Dell, is going to read to you what they said. It'll take a minute and a half, but I think it's best we hear all of what they've yeah, got yeah, to say. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Because this is for the Americans. This is what they've said to your mob. And I know in America right now, you're going through horrible negative times, and they're saying something different here. So, Del, big loud voice for the mob out there. We have been telling the people that this is the 11th hour. Now, you must go back and tell the people that this is the hour, and there are things to be considered. 
Where are you living? What are you doing? What are your relationships? Are you in the right relation? Where is your water? Know your garden. It's time to speak your truth. Create your community. Be good to each other. And do not look outside yourself for the leader. There is a river flowing now very fast. It is so great and swift that there are those who will be afraid. They will try to hold on to the shore. They will feel they are torn apart and will suffer greatly. Know the river has its destination. The elders say we must go off, off the shore, push off into the middle of the river, keep our eyes open and our heads above the water. And I say, see who is in there with you and celebrate. At this time in history, we are to take nothing personally, least of all ourselves. For the moment that we do, our spiritual growth and journey comes to a halt. The time for the lone wolf is over. Gather yourselves, banish the word struggle from your attitude and your vocabulary. All that we do now must be done in a sacred manner and in celebration. We are the ones we've been waiting for. Hoppy elders, hoppy nation. I'm sorry, I read his name. Just wow. out of respect. Uh, Arabi Arizona. Oh, I don't know. Mm. <laughs> My apologies, we can't read his name properly, but it'll be up on it's up on the article we're putting up tomorrow. Wow, that's fantastic. And I think that's a really important part to lead up to with this because this is not just an Australian thing. And it's very important. What you said before about people around the world meditating, you've got to remember, I want you to think of the world like a spider web where the ley lines run through the whole of the world. And if a spider, if you land on the web anywhere, the spider knows and senses your vibration as it runs through there. So when you said before people were meditating on the solstice, meditating for other reasons, it didn't matter what form of meditation took place. It was important to put that into this river that the Hopi speak about. And what this is all about now is many people are going to attack the people who do this. And by the way, the people in our group have had death threats and they've had trolls on there. They've had all sorts of things that have happened. This will continue all the way through because many, many people will refuse to jump into this river. They'll grab a hold of the shore and they're too scared to go ahead. What I'm impressed with is there were 15 million people in our group that jumped into this river when all I ever said was, I'm not even sure if there's a river there. That's yeah. what I kept saying every time. There could be a river. But I did say this. I said, if this isn't there, there is nothing left. We have no leader on this planet that can lead us out of this mess, only take us further into it. There is nothing left in the way we do things anymore. We jumped into this river because we so, saw no, no alternative. It just turned out that after the event and the day before, I finally worked out just before there was actually a river. So what we now have is a situation now where the Hoppy Elders are telling us the hour is here. And secondly, the most important part of this, and it's so important, is people have got to stop looking in the sky for Jesus and the cross or even looking for the Pleiadians. We are the ones they said we've been waiting for. This is what the Hopi have said and what the original people here have said and all the Indigenous people are saying this. We are the ones that change this. There is no leader anymore. What I'm really taken by is the fact that that meditation was not arranged by anybody. It was arranged by everybody. And that's the difference in this now, as before, when people want to follow a book, we are no books. I would never follow me anywhere. I'm more broken than most people on this planet, so forget me as a leader because there's no way I am one. And we've made this time after time. Our job is to pass on information that others have. We don't know this information. We shared it with you. I mean, Dolores Cannon talks about this too, and we use a quote from her saying the same thing. We started with a hobby quote in this article, and we finished with Dolores Cannon. And she says virtually the same thing. There's two roads ahead. One is full of grief and anger, and the other is full of spirituality. Choose the right road. The Mayans said exactly the same thing. The difference is you've got, I'm sure you people understand, the keepers of the old way. There are a couple of tribes in America that are keep the old way, and the Hopi are one of them. When they say the hour is here, it is actually here. We were there when it happened. So what we're saying to people is this, and we're putting this out to everybody. Have a look at that Schumann resonance, and what you'll find the next day, it still resonates. 
from what we did the day before, all of us, what we put into that box. But past that point, it all becomes guesswork. Even when the elders were giving prophecies, they were giving prophecies for what happens to that event. Past it is a real, there's no line in the sand here. There are three possibilities I've heard for what happens. I do know one thing. It was never supposed to be a line in the sand on the 21st. That hasn't happened yet. There are people sitting on the fence can, that can go either way. Our understanding is this will take between three to four, maybe even five years before it's complete. At the end of that time, there will be two resonances on this planet simultaneously. The one that's beginning to pick up, that went to 30, that will go up into the hundreds and stay there forever, and a second one that will stay at 0.3, 0.6. They will maintain and they'll be running simultaneous to one another. But there'll be time in the future where their lower vibration will finally disappear. And when it does, every soul that chose, and by the way, your intellect cannot choose the path. Your soul and your karma will choose the rock, the path that suits where you're up to. So you can't stand there and say, oh, shit, I've worked out everything I've done is wrong. I'll go with that group. Your soul won't let you do that. It won't be Peter at the gate. You'll be judging yourself. And your judgment, uh, somebody told me this, from that day on, those people who are on that path, for the ones who aren't, every day it becomes exponentially harder to swap over. So every day as it passes, the choice becomes harder for people who want to get on that higher road. The challenge will become greater. And those that want to stay in the low road will be angry, will be aggressive, will threaten people. And by God, we've got a lot of that. All those things will continue. And what I've told people is the first thing is when they do that, it's what the hobby said, don't invest yourself in this anymore. All this crap that's going on, you can't be part of it anymore. And when they say the most horrible thing to them, you say whatever. And you shrug your shoulders and say, I don't care. And I feel sorry for you because you're on the wrong path. That's how you should approach this from now on. You shouldn't sit there in the back and say, God, one day I wish you could meet your punishment. That's coming. Don't wish that anymore now. That's happening. What you've got to say is when people say that, don't feed them by giving them more anger. Take everything they say to you. You don't have to like it. You don't have to love them. You don't have to give them a hug. Walk away and change the channel. But don't take their programming with you rid yourself of that negativity because if you keep it inside yourself you aren't going to jump into that river that the hoppy speak of and in america i think that hoppy that river is really a great analogy right now it's like it's cleansing the people in that river will be immune to all the rubbish around them that's what they're saying celebrate the people who are in that river with you because you know they've chosen to, and they're going to become your brothers and sisters in this this change that's going to take place. I mean, there's a lot of analogies there. I mean, right when you said that that guy in 2017 told you what was going to come after that ceremony, that there's going to be a split, I mean, that happens to be what we end up talking about on the show all the time, because it seems like, as we go on month after month, that there's going to be a split between people that want to, let's say, take the vaccine and people that don't want to. I mean, how... Did, could that be any clearer of a split that it's like, hey, you can participate in your technocratic society, but I'd rather choose freedom and not to be to take my own health. Well, I mean, under the, my the own statement hands about the and, gardens and stuff like that yeah. is, is like right. so spot on because that's kind of what we're doing here is we're getting ready for some sort of system breakdown. You're preparing this river. What you guys are doing right now, pointing out to people there's a river there. You've got to dive into it. This is what this is all about. Can I share with you a prophecy by Arnie Minnie Mace, who's been on our online conferences more than once will come again. And she made a prophecy five years ago in 2015, and I've mentioned it many times, and I'll mention it now, to let you know that the, the old way people knew this was coming. And she was asked what would be the first sign of the change. And I was there at the time with Evan, who's not here at the moment, and another lady who mentioned it to me when she said, you remember what Arnie Minnie Mace said? To which Evan and I both said, no. Nah. He said, don't you remember the toilet paper she spoke about in 2015? And we sort of looked up and said, what? What do you mean toilet paper? Oh, well, this is what she told you. And I know why I didn't remember it, because it's a stupid story. She was asked, what's the first sign of the change? And she said, it'll be toilet paper in the supermarkets. 
Wow. And what she wow. said, and I don't remember it, but one person did, and I know why, because I'll tell you what she did. She said that there will be people fighting over toilet paper. There'll be security guards guarding the toilet paper. It will be sold on the open market for inflated prices, and it will become the beginning of the way people start to fight against each other and turn against one another. And um, this woman said, that, don't you remember that? And we both agreed and said, no, of course not. It's a stupid thing to say five years ago. If there was a change, they'd go for food. It wouldn't be toilet paper, would it? She said, well, I believed it. You know what she did? Her name is Lavinia. She's from the Central Coast. She said, then I bought toilet paper. And after about a year and a half, the whole of my bedroom was full of toilet paper. And I left it there for three and a half years and waited and waited and waited. He said, eventually, I doubted Aunty Millie, and we started using the toilet paper from the bedroom, and it got smaller and smaller and smaller. And she said, the last roll of toilet paper we used was four days before COVID started. No way. Now, I want to make a point. How many people in the world five years ago predicted there would be a massive run on toilet paper in supermarkets, and the answer is one. Okay, she got that right. But remember, she said this was the first sign of the change. So when you doubt the fact that these elders, whether they're hoppy or original, none of them go to university. They don't have degrees. But I've got to tell you now, their prophecies are damn sight better than the ones who do have degrees because nobody with a degree would ever have prophesized the run on toilet paper, but she did. So, yes, it has been prophesized. It's been prophesized by the hoppy, and they've now said the prophecy comes to pass. Now, what people have got to do, and I think the comment made before about this is very important, You've got to make a leap of faith here. You really do. Nobody's going to give you... We're going to give you close. We're going to give you close to empirical evidence. Okay, yeah, we've got pictures of a UFO, four frames running over earlier at that time. Yeah, we're going to show you that. We're going to show you light doing things that should never do. We'll show you all that. But you've still got the choice to dismiss it and say that thing in Croatia was Photoshop. No, it wasn't. It went viral there. But, okay, if you want to believe it, fine, believe it. If you want to believe the sky goes blue like that, believe it. If you want to dismiss the Schumann resonance, do that. But remember, you are being given proof. We had none before. Now we've got some. If you can't accept that proof, then I'm going to say that the three ways this works, let me explain what they are. The first thing I was told is when that lower resonance goes and the souls go with it, and I'm going to make a point, we're talking well over half the population of this planet. That was made clear to me. This is not going to be a small clearing up of the, the, the poster. It's going to be a large one. I was told three things can happen. Number one, their souls are destroyed. I never believed that. You can't destroy matter. Number two, that their souls will be wiped clean, a bit like Jung's collective consciousness. They would go back as new souls and they would come back again completely untainted, but they'd lose all their memory and everything they've learned from every past life. I thought, that's tough. And the reason I think that's tough is this. Let's say that 15% of the population ascend. What about the person who was 15 point naught, 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 1%? I feel sorry for them. They just missed out. And they end up being saddled in there with a the cabal and with Gates and all that mob. And I feel like, man, that's not quite fair for me. Hell, oh, mate, was so close. was one word off. That seems a bit sad. But the other one I've been told, the one that I believe makes the most sense to me, is where there is no punishment. It's made clear to me the reason why these souls can't come back is if they incarnated in a planet that's ascended and running at 200 instead of 0.3 their soul, they would die. They are not ready for that high vibration. None of us are. At the moment, if we went straight to 200, we'd all pass on. We could not live in it. We are going to have to get used to it gradually. That's why it's taking this place. What I'm told is this. The ones that don't make it, their souls aren't destroyed. They just go to a planet that vibrates like the Earth does now, and they learn their lessons. And when they get it right, then they come back. So there's no separation as such. No, there's no heaven and hell in this. We create it. And for those that just missed out, we shouldn't pass judgment on them because it may well be that the person who's passing judgment was the next one in line that just crawled in as the last member on that group. So don't try and pass judgment on anyone and say, I'm better than you. That's not what this is about. This is about whether you are ready for the fact that this planet 
is going to become one of the most magical planets in the cosmos. And I've been told the reason why aliens from all over the cosmos have been here for so long is for everything leading up to this event, because what happens here is reverberates throughout the whole universe. This is important, not just for the people on this planet, it's for everybody. They call it the event. They're aware of what's taking place. And what we've give, trying to give for people is we're trying to give a load of empir semi-empirical evidence, which we're going to put in our articles. And I've, as I said, one's coming up with the seven in there, the three more. And in that one, you get your best evidence. I think Croatia is pretty damn good. And I think that the Schumann residence is good. But I think that one and a half seconds of white light shooting out of Uluru, for me, if you've got any semblance of getting it, you surely must lock into that one. And if we can't win you with that one, I'm sorry. I don't think you're ready for this road. I'm not even sure I can get on it, but I, I know what I can see. And what we saw there, that was the energy of Uluru turning on. Now, I want to make another point too. Much has been made of this word, the magic box. We were told this by one of the people who actually is one of our enemies who first told us about this. And yes, it is agreed the elders use that term. Now, I don't want to disappoint people, but there never was a magic box. But in the days of Lord of the Rings, it was a great term. Because if you look at Uluru from a distance, it's on a flat plane. You know what it looks like? A rectangular box. Uluru is the magic box. Mm -hmm. When you saw that light coming out of that magic box, inside that magic box, there are crystals that were put there by the Pleiadians to help Uluru do what it's supposed to do. You see, what it's going to do is this. Because that energy went outwards, as on top, so below, it went into the planet. And the earthquakes, the volcanoes that are taking place, the Earth is now righting itself. As you know, the Earth is wobbling in its rotation now. It's not flat. And as you know, North Pole is not where it's supposed to be. It's moving. It's sliding down into Siberia. All these things are happening anyway. What we've done to that place, what we've done as a collective, humans, is that the Earth will now start to heal itself from within. But it's going to be shaking around for a while because there's a lot of healing to be done here. It's not balanced, it's in pain, and it will begin to heal itself. And what we've done is made sure this will happen gently. The other way would have been a lot more dramatic. So now, we're at a stage now where people have been writing back and saying the same thing. And I was hoping they would say it, because unless they did, we were not going to put it up. I never wanted this to be we said. I wanted this to be us said. I wanted it to be everyone saying it. People are writing back and saying, why can't we do this again? And the answer is, I want everyone to do it again. But if you want to do it, please do it. Yeah. Because I know what happened. But this time, for the mob in, in um, Iceland that went out <laughs> into the pitch black at the middle of night, and had their bare feet in the snow and put snow, uh, put deer skin on and stuff like that. You don't have to do it then. Why not pick the only, only hour in the whole day when the sun's shining? Do it then. It doesn't matter when you do it. Number one, every person who meditated and locked in, when they go back, they've got a royal telephone. It's already open. They can go back to where they went before. They can do what they did any time that suits for the same group, and it will go back in again. Yeah. And what I'm saying to people now is we have a machine in the middle of Australia. It is the navel of the earth, the spiritual center of the planet. It is now vibrating. We've seen what it's done. We saw the energy come out. We saw the sky above us. We know it's working. If we keep doing it, if those 15 million people and others who didn't know, if you went and meditated, whether you knew it or not, your energy's in there. You're on that telephone anyway. And the beauty of it is you don't need, you don't need to know the number. You've already opened it up. You can go back wherever you went last time. And I'm going to make that point. That's the one important point. Where you did it before is where the telephone is and where the line is. Go to that place. It doesn't matter whether you face Uluru. It doesn't matter whether you face Stonehenge. It doesn't matter if you face a sacred American site. It doesn't matter. It's all linked together. And do what you did before. And what you will find 
is there'll be a constant stream of energy running into that rock, which will be charging the earth and healing the earth. And what we call that is seed dreaming. And what we're going to ask people to do is those 15 million people on a daily basis, as you go out into the world where people only ever talk about one thing, and they talk about the fear and the dread and the concern, and stop them. Stop them talking about this. Tell them that every time you make a negative thought, you are actually choosing the road you walk on. And you're not going to jump in the river. Because while you're thinking, and they told you there, the Hoppy said this, don't take anything personally, least of all ourselves. So therefore, whatever's given to you, they told you, don't take it. If it's negative, just tell the other person, are you feeling better talking about this right now? And they'll tell you, no, I'm not. Well, why are you doing it? Don't do it anymore. Then tell them about the story of what happened at Uluru. And if they don't believe you, then this is what you do. We call it seven seeds. And I wrote this and said, if you're going to do set seed dreaming, we want to give you some seeds. So here's seven of them. And what we'll do is the week after, we'll put another three seeds up, then another three seeds up. And in the end, we'll have 100 seeds there in a bag that we'll give people. And for those that don't believe in this, tell them to go to our website and look at the pictures, read the articles, and that way the seed dreaming will work. And what we've got to do is there are not enough people on this planet at the moment when this, this, this thing com is finished, at this moment we do not have enough people to live the way we're living now. We'll have to go back to hunter-gathering, and I don't want to do that. And I think most of us don't want to do that anymore. We're not asking you to live the old way, but we need more people living the right way here. Michael Tellinger talks about Mbutu as a way of living. That's the way of the future. And the original people are doing something up here very similar to that, where we're living under old rules and old way sensibility. But I've got to warn the men of one thing in the, in the future. It's been made clear, made clear to me by the elders I've spoken to. From this point on, when the change comes, there'll be no parliaments. There'll be people sitting around campfires in circles and the decisions will be made by women. Men have lost the right to lead and make final decisions. It's been decided by the elders, by the aliens and by the earth that we will come back to a matrilineal society and for a while the divine feminine has to be in the ascension. Now, the men can stand next to the women and whisper in their ear and suggest and, and plead and beg that they do this, but the women, and I've got to make this point, I mean proper women, I do not need, I don't need Margaret Thatcher or Golda Meir or women like that. I want women who believe in creation that are old way women steeped in old way sensibilities. They will make decisions for everyone and they'll be far better than the decisions we have now. So that's part of this change that's going to take place. Men have to understand for the last 6,000 years, we've been solely in control and the last 6,000 years on this planet has been the worst we've ever had. The second part that comes into this deal is the, the, the planet itself. It has two energies. One is called love, and the second one is called magic. And the magic of this planet will come alive again. You've got to remember in original society, before the white fellas come here, it was believed that every human being that was born had some degree of magic, and their role in their life was to culture that magic and make it stronger. That was the law. That will be the law again. I have been with an elder that disappeared in front of me and Graham Hancock and 10 other people, and Graham will say exactly the same thing. He completely disappeared. Then appeared about a minute later, smiling his head off, and somebody asked his wife, Christine, how did he do that? And she said, I've never seen him do that before. Don't ask me. Then he did tell someone, and he told them how he did it. And he said, don't you understand what I can do? Every human on this planet can do only I can see the curtain and you can't. That's his answer to that. In and the you've future, got other guys like Wim Hof that are finding different ways of hacking this sort of our perceived limits of our capabilities. Yeah. This is what's going to change, mate. This is what's going to change. This will be the new curriculum for our children to develop their magic. Because honestly, if you go back to our history, the Denisovans had a bigger brain than us. Neanderthals had a bigger brain than us. The ones I've got, the flat-headed skulls, 
their 1800 cc we are actually ranked six in the order of size of skull we weren't the most intelligent that's not why they bred with us they bred with us because we had magic and the pleiadians came here to learn our magic now for the last six to seven thousand years it was taken away from us but think about this even in the royal courts there was merlin there was Mos nostradamus and they kept them there because they were magicians and if they weren't magicians they would have killed them but they left them there because they were still magic then magic was part of the way we were it will come back again but unfortunately to begin with the men have to step back because collectively we've screwed the planet over badly and it's time for us to step back and let the women heal the place we can advise we can protect we can suggest but we can't make decisions we lost that right that is one of the rules i've been given about the change some men may object to that but i'm going to have to say i'm sorry the history is the history is clear if i was a history teacher in school and you know what i taught them about wars and who started most of them <laughs> and who were fighting in most of them so honestly mate that part is a given so the story of this is what happened in LaRue, I can never prove that what happened actually happened. What I can give you is a lot of very strong evidence, but nothing that's definitive. You know what was worrying the most? A lot of people said on that day, the spaceships are going to hover above Uluru. I thought to myself, oh, my God, I hope that doesn't happen. And they looked at me like, they said, what are you talking about? Yeah. I said, if that happens, all the ones who will fight is going to say, Oh, shit, the hippies and new ages were right. Yeah, I'm going to join them after all. We are not getting a proper spread. What I love about this and what the hobby has said is the day and the hour is here. You have to believe them. Well, they can't prove it. I can't prove to you that ceremony worked. Mind you, you talk to 350 people there, not one of them will tell you it didn't. They were moved, every one of them, bar none. And every one of them, bar none, said there was nothing like it in their, in their life ever before that. So they sensed it. What they're going to do, and what everyone that was involved in this, all around the world that was part of this, they have to go out and not only tell that story, but let them feel the emotions and the truth of what happened that comes from within them. That will be the delivery of that story as it's important as the pictures we offer them. And if well, they the don't, other thing is, is that yeah. it's not like a bunch of new age hippies and stuff like that where you're getting the information from. I mean... <laughs> For anyone who didn't didn't catch what what was mentioned in the beginning is when we're talking about the Hopi and all these elders and original people in Australia, we're talking about the the natives, the Aboriginals, the people that were here before us, the people mm -hmm. that you know have the folklore. And when we're talking about Australia, we're talking about the people that have now been proven to be the oldest Aboriginals on the planet. That's the point here. And if they are the oldest, then if they are the keepers of the first truth and they've done this ceremony to tell you the truth has come back, you have a decision to make. And, of course, there are many people that are attacking this in every way possible. And if you want, you can go with their, the vicious words they've put in. They've said they're crawling up the elders' ass and all sorts of horrible things. And they made a lot of horrible statements and a lot of horrible language. If you feel that you're drawn that way, I can't help you. This is supposed to be the time where every person on this planet if they don't like the show, change the channel. But don't I feel, but I feel like that's why you're getting pushback because you're, you're onto something. You've you've hit it. You've hit the nerve. You've, you've, uh, you know, this is important. Maybe it's a bunch of trolls. Maybe they know that this is taking place. You know, not the people that are doing it. But, I mean, who knows? It could be a bunch of fake accounts. I mean, I don't know if you know these people personally, but. Um, some we do, some yeah. we know and some we don't. Some I've seen where some work. I've seen what they do on people who put up something like that. Six of them will go in and, and talk to each other and just override the whole thing. And then the other people feel so threatened to say anything, they don't say anything because they know they're going to get attacked. We have actually, we did a purging um, on our website. We've got a large group on our website and our Facebook. It's well into five figures. And we just basically kicked out anyone that made a negative comment. First of all, it was swearing. Then it became, if you attack someone in an untoward way and make them feel threatened, that you will be thrown out. And people said, well, I didn't throw. I didn't swear. No, but you're, aggr you're angry. You are aggressive towards that person. And I keep saying the same thing. If someone says something you don't like, 
change the channel. Don't throw stuff and throw a book and a piece of concrete and a rock at the actual TV set and smash it. Walk away. And if you disagree, disagree with respect. And if you can't do that and you show them no respect, we kick people out. And we got into trouble for a lot of people doing that. And we said, no, in the future, in the future, everyone has a right to say something and nobody has the right to spit in their face. And I don't care how that comes out. If we feel someone's being aggressive, they are not welcome on our website. And we kicked out. It was funny. People said, oh, you're losing people left, right and centre. We kicked out about 50 and we, we're getting a waiting list of 150 per day and we can't get to them all. So every time we kick these people out, more people feel comfortable saying, I can go to a place where I can say what I want and no one's going to attack me because that is old way. That is the way we've lived this planet for so long. In the new way, everyone must show respect to other people. And if they don't like what they say, they say what I said before, whatever, whatever. I don't agree with that. But if that's what you want to hold and you hold it in a respectful way, I'm not going to attack it. If I am going to attack it, if I am going to challenge it, I must be so careful how I say this. If I become emotional or angry or start to lecture that person, please know that within a day you'll be thrown off our Facebook and you won't be welcome back ever. That is the way of the future. And what people have got to do is when you, they do this to us, and of course they do a lot, it's well known. Um, we've, we've had everything. In fact, right now I think we've been cursed again. And my son's reacting with another curse. And I'm a bit jealous because I actually caught up. We've both been cursed eight times, and it was 8-7 to him. And I got a personal curse. Now, we got one back, so he's now in front, 9-8. So I'm a bit jealous about the fact that he's been cursed one more time than me. I've had personal death threats where they've described it more than him, but he's in front in that way. But we make jokes about it. Why do we do that? Because we're not going to get angry with the people who do this. We're not going to react to them. We're not going to take it in. We'll get past it. And what we think is, isn't that sad that in these days when the hoppy have said the hour is here and we are the ones we're looking for, it's obvious that person is not one of the ones. And I feel sad for them because this time around the mistake they want will reverberate through their life and their lives for a thousand a years at least, maybe longer. It will change everything they do and everything will be different from that point on and they're going to lose so much. How can you be angry with these people? You can't. All I can do is I can feel sorry for them. I'm not going to give them love and light. I'm not going to come up and kiss them. I'm not going to do that. Some people say, give them love and they'll get better. No, 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 no. What you do is you see, dream them. You give the information out and if they take it fine and if they don't, that's not your decision anymore. Everyone now is that they said, remember how this finishes. We are the ones we've been looking for. Therefore, you as an individual... It's your responsibility now. No one can lead you down this path. And if you don't pick it up, I feel sorry for them. I do. But I'm not going to give them love. I'm not going to give them anger. I'm just going to say, well, isn't that sad? I'll walk away. And that's the best way to do this, ladies and gentlemen. If people yell at you all the time, whatever. That's actually, when you look at what they say, you'll find that every fault they point out it's not your fault. Do you know whose fault it is? It's theirs. What they're saying, if they say, as they say to us, you lie so much, you couldn't lie straight in bed. Well, I've never lied about anything. I mean, I keep the rocks here. I keep all the sacred objects here. If I lie to you once, they kill me. I know what I've got here. I've got so many different sacred objects that are here for protection, obviously, but also they're here to watch me. And they punished me to begin with the rocks when I broke protocol and didn't get things right. But I know if I lie... I have judges here that are not only just judges, they're executioners. I've got killing rocks here. I can't afford to do that. So I'm in a different situation where I can't even afford to tell a lie because I'd be killed for it. Others can. But you know what? You shouldn't. You don't need to anymore. You should never lie to someone who's telling you the truth. And the ones who are lying to you, don't worry about them. So this is very important. What we're saying right now is that everyone who's done this we ask you to do two things. Number one, it worked. Do it again. We're giving, getting you evidence. You'll see the evidence up there, and you'll know when you see this. If you've done it, you'll know, yeah. And then what we're also going to do, after a while, we're going to start putting up the comments that people put up. Once we've done enough pictures, 
to shut up the naysayers, then we'll put up the comments. And some of the comments are pretty wild. They're going to make some pretty wild uh, claims about what happened to them. But after you see all the pictures, why would you doubt it? The evidence we've given to you, we've given it to you, we've shown you. I mean, okay, eventually we're going to show you the four frames where the UFO went across there. Okay, we'll put that up, but don't worry. The ones who don't believe us are going to say, no, no, that was Photoshop. They're going to say that about everything. And for them, we can't help you. But we didn't Photoshop the fact that Neptune stopped spinning and went the opposite way. We didn't Photoshop the fact that we've had the largest earthquakes ever in Antarctic of all places, which is not supposed to be one of the main earthquake zones, but it is now. All those things happen. Pluto collapsed. All the energy there has collapsed. America is collapsing at the same time. That's not coincidental. It's not coincidental that it's one-fifth the power it was before because America is going through a horrible moment at the time and it's part of its cleansing. And what people have got to realise, yeah, believe me, you're going to have to make a decision about this. And if you do, and, you, and I'm, the only time I'm going to mention this, if you go the way they tell you, you're on their road. And once you take those injections, I'm going to tell you, it's going to be so much harder if you get off because don't believe, honestly, guys, there's things called nanotechnology. And you, and you guys know what I'm talking about. There's going to be things inside that they put inside your arm you don't want. Remember what Steiner said. He made this prediction over 100 years ago. He said they will make a vaccine in the future and they'll try and force everyone to take it. And he said, beware, if you take it, it will cut your soul off from your body. You will sever the link completely. And that's what they want. They fear our magic. And all the people now that are fighting for the right way to do this, remember now, you have the Indigenous people leading you. If the Hopis say the river is there, if the Mayans say the road's there, and if the elders say the rock has been turned on, well, what do you want? There's your evidence. Well, I mean, not and only that, not there's also Sorry. like the, the mythology of ancient Egypt that says twice in their history, the earth, the sun rose from, from the east and set in the west. And then yeah. there's, there's other, you talk about like Ben Davidson talking about the sun cycle, who cl basically collaborates everything you talked about at the beginning about the sun freaking the fuck out. And he's telling people to enjoy electricity while they've got it. <laughs> and, yeah, that's. <laughs> and it's just an interesting thing to consider. You know, it's, uh, it seems to be, especially when, you know, I, I kind of doubt our historical timeline of late more than I sort of ever have. I'm starting to think. <laughs> You know, I used to think it was everything before a few thousand years ago was bullshit, but now I'm thinking that could number could be, like, way less. Like, it could be everything before a few hundred years ago was bullshit. I think our future has been stolen from us utterly, completely and utterly. I mean, the point is, when they went to the indigenous people, they were keepers of the old ways and the old truth. So they had to destroy each one group. They did it, to, they went to every continent, one by one, Second last continent was America. Last continent, Australia. And what they did was they basically destroyed the culture and destroyed the mythology and destroyed the wisdom and destroyed everything that actually was our truth. Well, it's coming back. The whole of it's coming back. The indigenous old ways, I talk about old ways coming back and becoming our guide. Honestly, at the way we live now, if people don't realise the way we've been made to live, where we're hiding from each other, where we're not allowed to shake hands with each other, you've got to understand something. I don't know if you guys understand this. When original people shook hands, they did it like this. They would actually put their hands underneath their armpits and wipe the sweat and then put it on the other person's back and rub it into them. And they were giving part of their self to you. When you shake hands with another person, it is a lot more than what you think it is. It is a spiritual connection to another soul. By banning us shaking hands and keeping away from each other, they are trying to do what Steiner warned us about. <laughs> yeah. They're trying to make us not become human anymore because we are humans work as a collective. And they're trying to break that up into fearful individuals. Well, the mask too, yeah. Yeah, well, the mask is another one. What does a mask do? It captures all the stuff you're breathing out of your body you want to get rid of. That's the first thing it does, then leaves it there. And when you breathe it back in, it goes back into your body. <laughs> you've got to think about that. When you breathe out, it's a way of getting rid of things your body says, oh, we don't need this, guys. Sweat it out. And what they should also say is when you're sweating, drink it. Have that back too. Look, come on, take everything your body is getting rid of. Take it back. 
And think about this. You've got to think about what a mask is. It's actually a machine that catches the germs you didn't want and says you can have it back again. And then after a while you get sick and you're wondering why. Yeah, you actually poisoned yourself. And that they know that. They know that's what's happening. We got a question. Uh, we got a question from the chats. Actually, I just happened to notice it. It's about yeah. whether the rings from Atlantis that you were kind of mentioned before we started recording, whether they were incorporated into the ceremony or not. I was told to take two rings from Lemuria, which I did. Oh boy. <laughs> Many psychics look at them. Sometimes they've thrown up, and some have, have nearly killed one psychic. It was that dangerous, the energy in it. But one of them, I've cleaned to this extent now where people have actually, someone read it recently, says it's trying to get better. Yes, because I've got to make the point. I've slagged off Atlantis all the way through because those rings are just a piece of crap. All they want to do is kill everyone. But I've got to make the point. They were made with good intention, and there is good within them. And yes, Two Lemurian rings were taken and one Atlantean ring was taken and those rings were placed inside the formation. They were there. Uh, for the last formation, the one I did with people that went inside and meditated, they were in there. For the last one, the pure one, I did take out one of the Lemurian, I did take out one Lemurian ring and the Atlantean ring and I just left in uh, this one, the, the, the three animals. And the reason I left that in is I wanted to be very careful because the three animals there, because the other one, the Atlantean ring, has a motif that belongs to a human, Atlas. I learned one thing about this. The rings that only have animals you can trust implicitly because animals don't lie. The rings that have human motifs I have to be careful with because humans do lie. Oh, interesting. So for that last ceremony, to begin with, the Atlantean was there. And it was with me at that time, so it was part of it. But for the final ceremony, we went to Uluru. I just left this ring there in the middle of the two circles to contain that. So, yes, I did take one there, and it was in the first circle when people did meditation within. But for the final one, I had to be so careful. I just put an animal that's just got animals, a ring that's just got animals, because I know this ring has never lied to me and has no negative energy within it. And for that one, I had to be so careful what I put in there. I actually took five of my rocks to Uluru the day before and gave them three ceremonies, one at a family site, one at a men's site, and one at a women's site before I brought them back to the others. So I made sure that was okay first. I'm sorry, but I could not. I know a lot of people love Atlantis, and I would say to that, look, but don't stare. Because remember, these rings come at the end of Atlantis too, and the end of Atlantis was not a glorious time. They fell on their own sword, and each of these rings carries that energy within it. But for one of them, I have partially cleared it to the stage where this person said at one stage, oh, my God, there's still evil there. But it is trying to ascend itself. I just got another Atlantean ring quite recently, which has exactly the same motifs as the first one and was also found at Hill End. Oh, and it's an evil piece of work, I can tell you. But they've told me again, if I give it ceremony, I can save that one. So two can be saved. And the first one, I'm the only person on the planet who knows where it is. It can never be saved. And I will never tell anyone where it is. Can we if guess? I had my way, I go back to it and hope that it disappears one day. It is absolutely unsavable. That comes straight out of Tolkien's Mordor ring, I can tell you. It's just, it's beyond anything. It's just pure evil. And in that respect, I've got to tell you, remember Tolkien's story was based on a Scandinavian myth about three rings. And yes, we do have the three rings. And yes, he's right about one of them. It, I, we did think it could be... No, it can't. It can't. It can't be anything. But the other two, one is halfway there and the other one's quarter way there. In fact, it's getting a ceremony today at quarter past, at 21 past three. It's getting its first cleansing ceremony. I'm told that will happen. So for your gentleman that asked about that, two of the rings are going to be saved, we think. And one... If I had a volcano close to where I lived, it would have been thrown in there already. He said, "Did you?" He asked, "Did you put the ring on yet? Did you put the new ring?" On oh yet? yeah, yeah, yeah. I've had yes, I have put them on the new one. I've put on. 
and I made the mistake on one occasion. I put it on for five minutes. On one occasion, I forgot it was on, and I had this massive coughing fit. Oh, man, it was hurting, and I couldn't work out why, and I realised, oh, my God, it's still on my finger. Pulled it off, and straight after that, the coughing stopped, and it's never come back. So with that one, yes, I do wear two of them. I wear them each day. I put them both on each day. And I'm working with them, and I do believe we can bring them back to be useful on this planet in the future. The third one, I'm sorry, it's beyond the pay scale of any human on this planet. It will just kill you, and it will turn you completely evil. And I will never, I've worn it too long anyway, I will never keep its thoughts out of my head. And I can tell you now, it has not given me one positive thought, only the most horrific, horrible thoughts and dreams that I would never do. So for that one, but my the advantage I have is I have other cleansing rings, and secondly, I know how it works. So it's not going to do any more than just turn me into a piece of crap. So can we, you mentioned it a little bit about whether people want to meditate, that, that, that it doesn't matter that it's now, this week, next week, whatever, because we're all connected through time and all that, and then they can put energy into the rock. So maybe in. maybe even for people that weren't involved or weren't meditating on that day that may or may not have a regular meditation practice, can you maybe, do you want to describe a little bit about the ceremony for context and maybe yeah. maybe just say how, how people, if they want to incorporate this in their meditative practice, if they want something to focus on or whatever, what they can do if they don't even know about well, this yet? The best description would be the 300 we had. Okay, we had 300 odd people there. What did we do before 7.32? Man, whatever you wanted. We had an opera singer there at one stage. We had people playing crystal bowls, someone playing the ditch. Whatever you wanted. But the rules for this, I gave the rules at the start because I actually gave them sacred ash on each one because it came from a sacred fire. I was allowed to do that. The rules were this. The word COVID was banned, and everyone shared when they heard that, and I said the word negativity. There were, no one can say anything negative. Every thought must be positive. Nothing must be negative. Now, if you want to meditate, if you want to play drums, if you want to wear an antler, if you want to ask, there's a pagan group called Hailing, which is where antlers and they play drum music and stuff, and it's brilliant stuff. Bring them along if you want. Anything is okay. Anything is okay that is positive. It doesn't matter, but when you send that energy, that to me is what I call the cleansing process where you get yourself ready. When you send that energy, that must be done in silence. Whether that's 20 minutes in our case or 15 minutes or 30 minutes, it doesn't matter. Now, someone's written to me and said, I can't meditate. And I said, welcome to the real world, nor can I. I can't <laughs> yeah. meditate either. I've tried it. I've done the candle thing and all that stuff. It's bloody chaos. It comes out the same each time. You don't have to meditate. What you have to do is just think of positive things. That will be sufficient. All it wants to do is feed off humans, feed off what the energy we give and the thoughts we create. Look, think about your grandchild if you've got one. Think about the girlfriend that you love. Think about the rabbit that you like. It doesn't matter what it is, but during that period of time, make sure you control it so that when you finish talking about the rabbit, then go on to your grandson. Then when you finish doing that, think of something else. That is the most important part of this. It's not a meditation process where you have to create something. It's not where you have to visualize anything. This is different in that respect. It's solely a matter of you cleansing yourself so for that period of time when it wants to feed off you. It wants your energy. Then if it's tainted, it's garbage. It's got this water in the petrol and it's no good. It will not be accepted. If you are only thinking positive thoughts, that's all that is needed. But you need to remember leading up to that. You, that's the training period, that period where the dig is playing or you play some wonderful music. Or if you want to get in circles like this mob did and just dance around for a while, I don't care. That's not important. But what they were doing during that time they were dancing, I can tell you, they were laughing all the time and smiling. There was one, one, not one negative thought there. That is what you do before and after. You make sure you do things where negative thoughts don't come. But for that 20 minutes, it's pure concentration where you're trying to muster up every positive thought in your body and just send it. I don't care how it's done. That's not important. This is not... I remember there was one of our troll groups that were attacking us mercilessly, attacked this original man who said, could I have permission to dance? And they said, no. And I thought, oh, my God. 
You mean someone can't dance when they're a black fella? I mean, if it's a white fella, well, white fellas can't dance anyway, so it's not an issue. But black fellas can dance well. Why would you stop them doing it? And I thought, that's ridiculous. And I told that person, if anyone tells you how to do this, then join a church, join a set, join a cult. But don't become part of this, because this one, the Hoppy said, we are the ones we're looking for. So there's no guide for meditation, except that you make sure before you're happy and joyous, and during that period of time, all you're doing is just throwing that out. Positive thoughts to the point. rock? Sorry? Positive thoughts to the rock? Yes. Or Posi- if it's not the rock, then visualize Easter Island. Visualize Stonehenge. Right. Visualize right. a yeah. sacred powwow yeah. that's taken place with a hobby. It's all connected. Visualize yeah. something yeah. that is sacred. In our case, a massive storm that's coming in. We've got thunder oh, coming wow. in. Um, and we're going to get a huge storm. We had, um, I think, about 700 mils last month, and I think we're getting some more again. Even that, even just the clouds above, I mean, we had great clouds, I've got to tell you, man. Looking at those clouds, you couldn't have a negative thought. Maybe it's a bird that's flying past. Maybe it's a cow that's come in that's crying. Just find something. And, of course, if you're out by nature and you're near a creek, well, then it's easy, isn't it? You just look at the creek. If you're down by the ocean, you look at the ocean. It's just an, an act where you yourself are responsible for this. And there's no guide for this. This is what the hobby have said. Dive into that river. And don't worry about the fact you can't swim because you don't need to. You'll float on the surface here. This is going to be a different river. And the beauty of it is it's there now and it's running. So that's all you've got to do. And if you haven't done it before, well, you know what it's about now. You know that that rock is what's feeding that energy. So you know where it's going. Once you know where it's going, you know it's got a destination. Remember the hoppy said this river has a destination. It's Uluru. That's where you're going. And now that you've heard about this, if you want, visualise the rock. It's a massive rock. It's about 10 kilometres around, something like that. It's a massive piece of work. And it's the most sacred place I've ever been to. And I've been to a lot of sacred places, but nothing like that. And, of course, right now, it is the most sacred place on the planet. Nothing comes close to it because it's the focal point of every other site. And what it's doing now is energising every sacred ley line, and every sacred site in the planet. That's where it's coming from, and that's where it's going. And eventually, every one of those sites will have its own energy and be vibrating, and they'll all be lifting up together, and we'll be going with it. Wow, so that's, that's the way forward. Fantastic, Stephen. Well, you've blown our minds once again. And uh, and uh, if anyone needs to wants to get some more into the Atlantean stones, we did get into that quite a bit in the last episode. You're welcome to go back. I think Graham said it was number two hundred and two seventy five, maybe two forty six. I think so. No, I don't think so. We'll find out before the end of the show and let you know. But Stephen, give uh, give Evan our best, and we appreciate uh, your time and taking some time for us. And we'll have to do this again down the road and and check it all out again. No worries, mate. I appreciate you guys giving us the chance to pass this on. And next time we can talk about the rings if you wish, because there's a lot more with them, and um, that's an ongoing thing. But for now, the most important part is what we spoke about today, because that's basically the future of this planet, and there's nothing more important than that. Yeah, I mean, this was this was fantastic how you just unfolded that whole thing. I mean, I wasn't really expecting all those details. I feel like the timing was very good on this whole thing. Yeah, and it was episode 314. Yeah, we did that. November 9th, uh, 2018. There you have yeah. it. Okay, oh, yeah. Stephen, thanks yeah, again. Yeah, thanks, buddy. Appreciate day. it. Yeah. Enjoy well, the story. And thanks for asking us down. We'll see you again. Yeah, for okay. sure. Stay well, guys. Yeah, okay. give Evan our best. I will. Okay, okay. mate. Bye-bye. And that was our reconnection with Stephen Strong. Wow. What do you think, buddy? Yeah. That's kind of not what I expected, but yeah, pretty pro- pertinent uh, yeah, at the pro- same time. Yeah, exactly, appropriate. And we just had a, you know, we just talked to Dave Smith about recovery and positive thinking. And I mean, I like the open style of like not telling people what to do. Like your own, you're accountable for your meditation, whatever your positive thoughts. 
you know, it's all, and that's, it's all on you, man. Like, I, I like that. It's interesting, too, how we've got to the point lately where we've been saying the same thing, where you can't change people's minds. Yeah. You can yeah, just, he's like, just plant the seeds or whatever, yeah, and then that's Throw it. some seeds yeah, out here and there, and if they ask questions, but you great, can't. and if they don't. Yeah, you can't. Yeah, it's, it's just so many parallels, you know, yeah. we're all the way over in Australia. On an episode, on a money. podcast night that shouldn't have really had any parallels, it ended yeah. up uh, yeah. pretty pertinent to the whole situation without getting into the covid too much anyway big and, then, and then the synchro i mean uh, we just mentioned clint before the show oh yeah well i think clint comes around more often oh uh, maybe i just haven't seen I, him. I haven't seen him for a while. i was like i haven't seen clint for a while and he's the one that recommended us uh, yeah we originally. were literally just talking about clint like moments before we went live yeah, and, and then, then he said hi and then he's like actually put his name in there and said hi that's crazy yeah, absolutely. So a uh, big thanks to Stephen for coming on the show. Big thanks to his wife for the reading. Big thanks to Evan who was oh, able yeah, to... what a reading, eh? Evan I'm was hoping, able to set up the connection me. and everything for us, even though he wasn't feeling great, and uh, make it happen. So big shout-out to those guys. Big thanks to them. Big thanks to you guys for listening and uh, supporting. Big th- Even bigger thanks to those of you who choose to support the show, grandamerica.ca slash support. We do do all this content. This will be pretty close to episode, probably somewhere around, oh, 475 or so, all for free. We've got the other Grand America Outlaw feed for free, all this shit for free. We do that on the value for value, what we call it. So we'll just throw this all out into the world. And if it's giving you some value, adding some value to your life or to your day or to your commute, to your workout, you decide, you know, you can pay a cable bill or you can rent a movie or you can buy a coffee or you can listen to the Grand America show. And you can do that for free and you can support when you can or if you can or you can sign up for a monthly. But that's how the value for value model works in case you're confused, in case you just think it's you just listen to the podcast for free all the time. I mean, you could do it that way. But... It's supposed to work that if you get some value from the show, you send some value back our way. America.ca slash support if you can, when you can. Um, oh, there's a bunch of other ways in the show notes that you can help us out. If you don't have any money right now, you know, you can review the show. You can share the show. Show notes, spam, gram. Tell your friends. Sign up for the newsletter a million ways. And uh, most Love of them and positive. Magic. Love and magic Love and positive. Love and magic and positivity, baby. This is what I'm talking about. And... Uh, Enjoy electricity while you can. All right, guys. We love you. Thanks for listening. And we will see you next week. All right, guys. Thanks for tuning in to the live stream. Yep. Thanks. I got a piece so bad right oh, now. Yeah. It's fucking crazy. I drank almost this whole jar of water and this whole <laughs> cup of coffee. So Yeah, thanks a lot for joining us. Really thanks appreciate for tuning into the live show, guys. We appreciate it. We'll see you. Uh, let's see. I think we're back Wednesday. Next know. Wednesday? I don't know. I can't remember. Next we Wednesday, we got a double with uh, JCCF. That's the Justice mm. Canadian Constitutional Lawyer, guys. I don't know the exact thing right now. And then we've got... Uh, ooh, and then after that, at 7, we've got our first episode for the... Grammarica Outlawed first interview, I guess, right? Will be... Shepard Ambala is talking about his documentary, Shackled to Silence. I better watch that. I'm waiting for the DVD. Oh, okay. Is there any other way to watch it? We can rent it, but it's like oh, 20 it. bucks. That's okay, I'll rent it. All That's right. Fine. Well, I'll just rent it for you, and I'll send you the link. Okay. All right, guys. Thanks for tuning in the live show. We love you. Be kind to each other. Be positive. Uh, thanks for listening. See you next week. Oh, that's the wrong thing to do. I got to hit this now.